Well, good morning. Good to see you guys. I'm going to try to do it without crutches this morning. We'll see what happens without a seat. Seems uh, no matter how I'm standing or how I'm seated or whatever, it's uh, uh, distracting and odd for some of you. So I'm going to try to just stand here. And uh, If my knee buckles, I'll fall down, but don't worry, I'll keep preaching. And uh, it'll take me a minute to roll over and climb back up, but I can do it. I've practiced at home and up here, so I, uh, I can fall and get back up. Hey, we'll be in Colossians chapter 1 again this morning if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. Um, as you're making your way there, I want to let you know that uh, Sunday, April 17th is what? Easter. Easter. We'll have two services Easter morning. Two services, one at 9.30 and one at 11.00. We're just kind of splitting the morning up, one at 9.30, one at 11. Each will go right at an hour, not an hour and 15 minutes, not an hour and 20 minutes, right at an hour. Um, so I encourage you, obviously, to be here. Christ people gather uh, and celebrate Resurrection Day all around the world, but also to truly be praying about men and women, co-workers, classmates, in your life right now that God has sovereignly placed around you that you may reflect his light to them. And as the, the days draw closer to Easter, they're going to begin to see and hear more of Jesus even if they're trying to avoid it, right? He's going to be on magazine covers in the grocery store, even in Walmart. Um, he's going to be on the Discovery Channel and... Nat Geo and Smithsonian and the History Channel. There are going to be documentaries about him. You and I have no idea whose hearts and minds God's already at work in on our streets, in our places of work, where we um, play, where we bank, where we shop. So um, we're going to be giving you tools, obviously, as we get closer uh, to you to invite. But just be praying about that. Second thing is this. Two services means two LM Kids hours that we need um, fully staffed, right? So that we're ready to receive people, to love on and to minister to their children as uh, their parents and their families are loved on and ministered to and given the gospel in here. So we're going to need more LM Kids volunteers Easter morning than we do normally. So here's what I want to ask you to do, and I'm going to be abundantly clear that we're asking you for that one morning. That one morning. To be the church and to say, I will serve where the church needs me to serve, that God might be magnified in Christ, and that those who are not regularly in the presence of his people and the spoken gospel witness, seeing his people love one another and serve one another, might be able to come and do that and be cared for appropriately. I'm going to ask you, if you don't normally serve in LM Kids and you don't hate children or God, <laughs> and you're willing to serve one of those hours, Julie will reach out and work out the hours and get it all taken care of, but would you simply write LM Kids somewhere on your connection card, front or back, LM Kids. You are not being asked to serve all year. That one Sunday. We're asking you to serve one and to sit one. To come, to serve an hour in LM Kids, and then to come in here the other hour, be it the first or the second, and worship the resurrection of our Lord, the suffering servant who came to give his life as a ransom for many. Right? LM Kids on your connection cards. And if we don't get enough this morning, right, we'll just rerun this reel each week. Until Julie says, we're good to go. Um, but I know uh, many of you will write that, and God will be magnified in Christ, and families will be cared for. Um, and you will be um, filled with a sense of fulfillment, delight, and satisfaction as you serve simply because you're asked to serve. That at the heart is what service is uh, biblically. It's simply serving because we're needed. So, that out of the way, let's talk about what it means that you and I in Christ have been qualified by God. Been qualified by God. Let's read again Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. We'll read through 14 this morning, and we will really only focus on 12 through 14. But I want you to see it in the context of Paul's discussion and reasoning here. First, well not first, Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. 
For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of our Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, Paul says here that part of what we're able to do because of what God has done in our life Part of the the fruit of that is that we give thanks to God the Father. And we give thanks to God the Father because he has qualified us to share in the inheritance of his people, of the holy ones, of the saints. He's brought us into the family. And now the inheritance that is God's and God's alone, that he graciously bestows on his heirs first and foremost his son and then co-heirs those who are added to the family through his son now belongs to you that inheritance is yours all that is God's is made available to you through the son Jesus Christ to share in the inheritance verse 12 says of his holy people in the kingdom of light And I just remind you again that in Scripture, as often in so many cultures today, light symbolizes all that is good and right and just and pure and joyful versus, obviously, the darkness. But I want to say something so we don't miss it here. Um, Being qualified is, is something more than simply being not being unqualified. There's a difference in being unqualified and being disqualified. You with me? Most of us in here, if I could make a snap judgment based on human perception, could not quickly qualify for the Boston Marathon. Right? But let's say one or two of you could and did through your own effort. You were unqualified and then you qualified. But as happened two years ago, if while running, two or three years ago, if while running the Boston Marathon, you decide to take a detour and slice off about four miles because you're a loser, and you get caught, you are then disqualified and unable to finish the race, unable to call yourself a Boston Marathon finisher, unable to be a part of that group that's run that race. Friends, it's not simply that you and I are unqualified to share in the inheritance of God. It's that we are disqualified. We have tried to shortcut and shortchange and run our own lives and spit in God's face and be our own gods and make our own decisions and decide what we're going to do with our money and decide what we're going to believe ethically based on what we think is right, our truth. From the earliest age, you and I are not just unqualified, we are disqualified disqualified from the kingdom of God, from the people of God, from the eternal life that God holds out for those who love him in and through Jesus Christ. We stand apart. But Paul says that we give thanks to God. We give thanks to God the Father because through God the Son, he has qualified us. God is the active agent in redemption, has qualified us to share in this inheritance. I'm going to read a little bit more scripture this morning than I like to from different places, so don't try to keep up and turn there. You can just um, you can just listen, but I want to flesh out some of the words and concepts that Paul uses here. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28 says, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast 
before him. Paul is reminding us that that you and I were at enmity with God. We were warring against God. We were making war on God with no ability to do anything else and no desire to do anything else when he sought us out and he found us and he called us and he qualified us through Christ. It is his work. It is his work. 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, get back over there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 writes to, uh, Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica and he says this in verses 13 and 14. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. Because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You, and I don't want you to miss either the Trinitarian formulation that Paul has here. He has God the Father in verse 13, the Holy Spirit, verse 13b, verse 14, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God we should give thanks to God because of what he has done for us in Christ Jesus. He has qualified us to qualify uh, the, the way that Paul's using it here is, is to make something or someone worthy or fitting or appropriate. God has made you worthy of the inheritance of his children. He's made you fitting to receive that and to participate in all that that brings. He's made you appropriate to be in the presence of a holy God. Douglas Moo says that God the Father has himself provided, has himself provided, what sinners need to be considered worthy to join the people of God. This is necessary, as I said, because it's not just that you were unqualified before Christ and outside of Christ, but you were disqualified. There was nothing that you could do to qualify yourself. So what does it mean to be qualified? What's had to happen For God to qualify us. What has he done that has resulted in your qualification and mine to be called children of God? To live with God. To walk with God. To know God now. To not sit and wonder. I I wonder what will happen when I die. It's already happened in you. You're already alive to God in Jesus Christ. The Spirit has sealed you to God. You belong to him. In death as in life, in life as in death, though all the more in death. Paul says, God has done in your life three things, though, by way of qualifying you. He's rescued you, he's transferred you, and he has redeemed you. Let's look at Paul's language here. Verse 13, for... For you're qualified because he, that is God, has rescued us. Paul moves a little bit in terms of his grammar here from first person plural to second person plural and second person plural to first person plural because he knows he is counted among those that God has by his grace alone qualified. For he has rescued us. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Let's pause there just for a minute. God has rescued us to to rescue, to rescue as Paul's using it right here is to deliver someone or something, to deliver someone or something from the kingdom, rule or authority of another by overwhelming force. Paul saying you've been rescued by God. You've been delivered by God from the rule, the kingdom, the dominion of another, of darkness, of Satan, by God's overwhelming force that Satan simply could not compete against. It's a powerful picture here. It's a picture of snatching one from the grip or power of another one. And Paul says, this is what God has done. And I think you and I struggle with this. I'll say more about it in a minute. But if we were to ask the question, what is it that, that uh, those in Christ have been saved from? Uh, I wonder what the answers would be. We might say sin, and there is 
a degree to which that is true. We might say Satan, and there's a degree to which that is true. That is certainly a, a, a slice of it that Paul's getting at right here. You know, I might say uh, an eternity spent in hell separated from God, and that would absolutely be true. But Romans 1 would say, ultimately, you and I have been saved from the wrath of God. From the wrath of God that is being stored up. For those who reject him. For those who live in open, active rebellion against him. And before we get to unsettled by that, where there is no wrath and judgment, there is no love and kindness and justice. There cannot be. I, I ask you what the world would think of Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, if as Russian forces came in and decimated Ukrainian cities bomb civilian centers and apartments and condos and homes and businesses and hospitals and orphanages and maternity wards. Zelensky did nothing. He just stayed in Kiev or Kiev, as they're saying, and he hunkered down and he ate Kit Kats and he drank Big Red or Coke, right? And he had... No sense of indignation, indignation or anger or active opposition toward the forces that were destroying his country and his people. You think we might feel different about Zelensky than the world feels about him today? We know intuitively that if there is love and justice, there must be wrath and retribution. We just don't think we deserve it. Because we can look around and always find someone worse than us. That's why no one thinks they're greedy. Because we can always look around and find people who are worse than us with money. Who make more and spend more, therefore we always feel frugal and middle class and generous. It's the same thing. But Paul says, no, don't, don't make any mistake. Don't be under any illusion about who you belong to outside of Christ. Outside of Christ, you belong to the dominion of darkness. And that dominion is at work in our day now, 1 John, and this won't be up on the screen, but 1 John 5, 19 might be up on the screen. I don't know what will come up on the screen. But 1 John 5, 19, John makes plain that, that Satan rules this world. That t for the time being, outside of the expansion of the kingdom by the gospel in our lives and brothers and sisters in Christ around us, that the systems and the nations and the kingdoms of this world are ruled by darkness. This is why we see Russia at war in Ukraine. This is why we see Iran bombing the U.S. consulate last night in Iraq. This is why we see China issuing unprovoked threats about Taiwan and so on and so forth. We could go right down to the crime in your city and mine. It's the dominion of darkness. And as Paul would be talking about this, this rescue, this rescue, what he has in mind here is both God's former rescue and deliverance of his people from Egypt and his rescue and deliverance of them from the exile. God has done this magnificently in two significant ways in their past. And this is forming and fueling and shaping the way that Paul speaks now, the way that he understands what has been done ultimately for God's people in and through Jesus Christ. In Exodus 6... We find this, therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you up, who brought you out from under the yoke of of the Egyptians. It's this, this Old Testament picture of redemption, of delivery, of having been rescued from Egypt. We find it again in Isaiah. As the writer of Isaiah is speaking about God's bringing his people back from exile as they've been scattered. We see this among the Ukrainians in our day. There's a diaspora happening. There's a, a scattering of, of native ethnic Ukrainians to surrounding countries and eventually to countries all around the world. Just as happened to the Jews. I'm not making any kind of prophetic connection, so don't get weird on me. I'm just saying uh, what happened to them by the hand of God, we're seeing happen in a broken world to people who've been invaded by another nation. 
Isaiah 42, 16 says, I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. This is God speaking about his people in exile following the decimation of the northern and southern kingdoms by Assyria and Babylon and the carrying off of God's people. He's going to deliver them. He's going to bring them back home. Paul has this language and understanding from his own conversion. He says in Acts 26 that, that Jesus said to him that he's, he's called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles to open their eyes in verse 18 and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Satan or God? Light or darkness? There is no other way. And what's amazing here is this word for dominion is the word in Greek exousia that's normally just translated authority. And what Paul is saying is that outside of Christ... You and I were under the authority of Satan and Satan's dominion. There is no in-between. We were under the active power or energy that Satan exercises over those who belong to him. This dominion, as we see here, is the dominion of darkness, characterized by intellectual, moral, and spiritual blindness. Intellectual, moral, and spiritual blindness. This is part of what's being undone and transformed in Christ. That's why Jesus says that the the great commandment, the greatest commandment, is that you and I love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's a picture of having had our, our hearts opened, our eyes opened, our minds opened. That we've gone from darkness to light. And don't be confused, church. No matter how happy, successful, or self-assured someone is. And I'd say that for you this morning. No, hap- no, no, no matter how happy, successful, or self-assured anyone in here may be. Apart from Christ, you lie in the power of the evil one and his control. It is the forces of evil that guide and direct the desires of your heart, the meditations of your mind. Sam Storm said it this way. This won't be up on the screens unless it's a miracle. Don't be misled by what appears to be worldly success. Burgeoning careers, civil behavior, the respect of peers, backyard barbecues, and children who score high on the ACT notwithstanding, they are in the power of the evil one, energized by the domain of darkness. This describes suburbia, friends. This describes the world in which we live, the culture uh, in which we interact, the waters we swim, civil behavior, burgeoning careers, respective peers, backyard barbecues, high-achieving children. But in redemption, and we're going to see this in just a minute really clearly, in redemption, God rescues you from the authoritative tyranny of Jesus or of Satan, from the authoritative tyranny of Satan to the authoritative love of his son. From one form of slavery to another. Paul here is pointing to the universal impact of God's saving act, and specifically to the conversion of the Gentiles. Look what he goes on to say. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. The kingdom of the son he loves. Paul is not just saying that we've been rescued, but we've been transferred from one place to another. We've been rescued from one place, but we've been transferred to another. And what he is ultimately saying here is that the true and ultimate rescue from exile, which would have been in the the background of his Jewish listeners, comes not in a return to the land, but in redemption from sin through Christ. Let's look at this transference and what Paul uh, is talking about here. What he's saying here is God doesn't just snatch us out of the domain of darkness. He brings us into the kingdom of light. The kingdom of the Son he 
loves. The kingdom of the son he loves. And when Paul uses this language here in verse 13, he's pointing back to Jesus' baptism. It's a reference there to God the Father speaking down, affirming God the Son and to the fulfillment of God's promises in Christ in a way that Israel had failed to do. Israel simply didn't have the power to do. They came up short every single time. David Poe says that this, uh, this phrase, the son he loves, points back to God the Father as the ultimate actor in the drama of salvation. The son who redeems through his own blood is the ultimate expression of God's love for us. As Paul says emphatically in Romans 5, 5 through 9. You want to know how God feels about you? We say again and again, look at Jesus. Not just at how Jesus acts and what Jesus says, but look at Jesus on the cross. If you want to see ultimately how God feels about you. Um, International Justice Mission is a, uh, an NGO, a non-governmental organization, nonprofit that I've been familiar with for a long time now. I really, really love the work that they do. Um, uh, the name gives a lot of it away, International Justice Mission. Um, they, they work to protect the poor and vulnerable from slavery, trafficking, violence, and legal injustice around the world. Work with a, a lot of uh, uh, sex trafficking, a lot of um, sex slavery that goes on around the world. And uh, they have primary offices in over 14 countries. It's really a, a massive, massive group of attorneys um, and other workers that work within the legal structures of nations because slavery um, in any form is not legal in any nation today. Yet we know it exists and thrives in many. And, and International Justice Mission, uh, IGM, IJM goes in and they, they work with host nations and they work with their attorneys and their laws and their justice system to rescue people. But one of the points that they make, and I, I've seen this as, as I've interacted uh, with uh, people and that organization some throughout the years, is that they don't just rescue, they also work to restore victims. They don't just rescue men and women and children out of slavery and sex trafficking but they actively work to restore them, to provide them healing and wholeness through the power that only the gospel gives, through all kinds of assistance, as long as their journey may be. Can you imagine how cruel it would be to, to bring people out of slavery, out of trafficking, and then just leave them there? With no skills, no resources, no sense of healing or wholeness, Paul's saying, God hasn't done this. God doesn't just rescue us from the dominion of darkness. He brings us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. He transfers us. Here, dominion parallels kingdom. You've got Satan's dominion. You've got the kingdom of God. And darkness parallels the Son. Satan's dominion, his control, his energy, his kingdom is characterized by darkness. But the Son of God and his kingdom and his people are characterized by darkness light. One more thing, look at verse 14. God has rescued you in Christ. God has transferred you into his kingdom. He has redeemed you. Third and final, he has redeemed you from the power and penalty of sin. From the power and penalty of sin. We dare not underestimate how serious our sin is before God. That's why uh, truly Christian people are confessional people always. We are always confessing before God our sin. Not that we have to be re-rescued in the big sense, but in a little sense, day by day, we're confessing our sin that we might be cleansed by God, purified by Him, sanctified, grown, moved beyond certain aspects that have a hold on our life at any time given time. Let's look just briefly at what some uh, places in Scripture say about this. Isaiah, Isaiah verse 40, or chapter, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Man, the great confidence in this is that God blots out my sin for his own sake. For the glory of his own name, that his own people will not be a dark stain on his name. And he remembers them no more. Do you believe this morning that in Christ God remembers your sin no more? That he sees you through the lens of the righteousness of Christ? 
When he looks at you, that's why Scripture can say you're a good and pleasing people to him. You are his treasured possession, a delight to the eyes of the Lord. Isaiah 44, 22 says, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. For I have redeemed you. The prophet Micah in chapter 7, verses 18 and 19 says, Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Don't miss this. This is who God is. God is the God who delights to show mercy. He doesn't delight to judge. He doesn't delight to to pour out his wrath on sin and sinful humanity. He delights to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. This is important because we need compassion again and again and again from a holy God. Do we not? I do. I need compassion again and again and again from my wife. And for my children, much less my God. You will tread our sins underfoot. This is a picture of God's violent, violent crushing of our sin that we see most purely on the cross. And hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. The depths of the sea for people in Micah's day was that place from which no one and nothing ever returns. No one and nothing ever returns. This is what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. What God has done for you in Christ Jesus. One more passage here from Psalm chapter 32. Psalm chapter 32 verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. Whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. The psalmist would say, you are a blessed people. This morning where you sit, regardless of whatever strain you have relationally, regardless of what's happening in your bank account or not happening, regardless of what's going on in your home, what's going on in your mind and your heart, the truth is, for those of you who are in Christ, you are a blessed people. You go through the rest of your day with the blessing of God upon your life. You go to bed tonight with the blessing of God on your life. You rest in peace and assurance through the night with the blessing of God on your life. You wake up tomorrow to encounter whatever tomorrow holds with the blessing of God on your life. In and through Jesus Christ. Christ. God qualifies his people, Paul says, for and in conversion, which is what we're talking about with being rescued, transferred, and redeemed. We're talking about our conversion based on the redemptive work of the Son applied by the Spirit. God the Father qualifies you through the work of God the Son and applies it by God the Spirit. The gospel of salvation is always fully Trinitarian in nature. And this language of having been redeemed here, it's, it's first century slavery language. All of, all of Paul's listeners, as, as the letter to Colossians is being read, would have in the back of their minds this picture of a slave uh, being, being able to pay the price for his or her freedom, being released. And then Jews would have, additionally in the back of their mind, uh, the, the great work of God in the Exodus that we talked about a few minutes ago. And what Paul is saying here ultimately and what he is seeing is the fulfillment that God promised that we have recorded in places like Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 is God is, is preparing the world for that great Uh, return from exile, that great exodus, that great redemption, rescue, transference um, that's going to come through his son says this, the days are coming, Jeremiah 30, 31, 30, 31, 31, 
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and the people of Judah. I will not be like, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. You hear the work of the Spirit here? I will be their God, and they will be my people. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, if we look at this in Ezekiel chapter 30, what did I say, 36? Chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. God, looking forward to this day, says, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. And give you a heart of flesh. How many of you in here could say before Christ's great work in your life. You had a heart of stone. And God gave you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you. And move you to follow my decrees. And to be careful to keep my laws. This is the work of God's spirit in your life. Bringing you new life, empowering you to live in that new life, reminding you that in Christ, through the mercy of God and the forgiveness of your sins, you are blessed. And you are being blessed. It's not just a status God has granted you. It's a way of life God brings you into in his kingdom. N.T. Wright notes that Paul here is asserting that in Christ, who's the true Israel, the true king, the one whom God loves... God's people of every tribe and tongue are rescued from the dark power that has enslaved them and brought into all the blessings of membership in the new covenant. And chief among these blessings is the fact that sin has been dealt with. Paul says here that God has redeemed you from your sin. He's released you from the power and penalty of sin in your life. And you are free, free, free in Christ this morning. Charles Spurgeon said, Oh, the blessedness, the double joys, the bundles of happiness, the mountains of delight that abound to the forgiven. I pray as the band uh, makes their way back up here and begins preparing to lead us in response, both uh, in worship to the Word of God and to the work of God in the lives of His people. And for those of you who are uh, baptized believers in the observance of communion, as you feel led to step out during this final song, I pray that you could say with Spurgeon, oh, the blessedness, the double joys, the bundles of happiness, the mountains of delight that abound to the forgiven. It doesn't matter what you've done. Don't you dare put what you've done above what God's done on the cross in Christ for you. Are you out of your mind? You really think you have that much power that you can sin in some way, that God's not powerful enough to redeem you out of that? If he can snatch you from the power of Satan and death, you think God can't redeem some stupid thing you did? He can, and he has, and he does, and he will again because of his great mercy. You're his child. You will never fall down that he doesn't pick you up. You will never fall down that he doesn't wrap his arms around you and hold you while you cry and weep with you and restore you. Our joy, our peace, our hope, our love, our life as a community is rooted in, dependent upon, and in response to God's great faithfulness. It doesn't depend on you. Thank God. God's great faithfulness to the glory of his own name and the good of his people. Always the glory of his own name and the good of you, his people. What Paul ultimately is saying here is that through the faithfulness of God in Christ, all we have needed, all you have needed, his hand has provided. And all that you will need and all that we will need as a community of faith, his hand will provide. Let's stand and pray.
God, we, we worship you in this place this morning. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we right now specifically thank you that we are a blessed people because of you. God, that we've been rescued from the dominion of darkness. God, from the authority and power of Satan and the evil forces of this world. And we've been transferred into your kingdom, God. Into the community of your people under the lordship of the son you love. God, and we've been redeemed fully from the penalty and power of sin in our own lives because of your faithfulness. All that we have needed, your hand has provided. God, we lift our faces to you this morning and declare with one voice, God, that we believe this truth and we know that all that we will need, your faithful hand will provide to the glory of your name and our good as your people. Pray in Jesus' faithful name.